technically my talk is entitled Apache Pulsar Development 101, but I'm going to cover pretty much Apache Streaming Development 101 with some Pulsar, with some Kafka, Flink, NiFi to give people understanding of the different streaming technologies, how they play together, how to do them pretty easily and do that from a Java focus, but show you where maybe sometimes you don't have to write code, which is really nice. You write SQL, you do just some configuration, pretty easy. So some a little bit of streaming, a little bit Pulsar. Pulsar with Spring, which is gonna be a in-depth talk later by the team that developed it. It is easy, so I'm not gonna to show too much of it, just give you a sample. It is surprisingly easy. The very easy way to add streaming or messaging to your apps with a couple lines of code. A little bit on Kafka, Spring against Kafka, and what I call the flipping or flank stack, and that's where all my stickers are. That is using those open source Apache tools together to make things really easy and cover as much uh, real coding as possible. This is me. I worked a couple different places, including Pivotal with Spring, Hortonworks, Stream Native, Price Waterhouse, um, back at Cloud Era, covering a whole bunch of different streaming. And I do a lot of meetups. If anyone is a speaker looking to do a talk somewhere, I do New York, uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia, sometimes San Francisco. Let me know. Always looking for more speakers. I do a weekly newsletter cover everything, like everything streaming, open source. It's really long. I put in GitHub, so if you don't want to have to subscribe, you can just look later. So let's get to uh, some meat here. What is streaming? Really, the simplest part comes to take something from somewhere, put it somewhere else, do something in the middle. And that en encompasses a very large ecosystem from open source, closed source, kind of open source, everywhere from on-premise to the cloud. I think what I've seen recently is a lot of people are going from trying to sync up their on-premise stuff with their cloud stuff, because everyone has to have some both, unless you're really tiny, you're still running some apps legacy. This is this part on the legacy stuff, or you want to call legacy if it's never going away, I don't know. Um, Pulsar can talk those other protocols. So it's a very nice way to take whatever you have on premise, get it into the cloud, without a lot of heavy lifting. You don't need to write a Java app for every single thing, especially repetitive, boring stuff that they usually made the uh, new people do, you know. Just write stuff that has value, get stuff done, builds an app. Oh, I see some new people coming in, so I'm just gonna say hi. And all the slides will be available. We didn't really cover anything except me trying to promote my free stuff. So we're at the, the fun part, streaming. What is it? Grab some stuff quickly, get it somewhere else. Though some people don't care if it's quick. I mean, some people will say, I have a giant file, get that somewhere as soon as you can. Sometimes we break it up, sometimes not. That's where we have to decide what part of streaming tech do you want to do and when do you do it. Like in the middle is probably the most important or the part that gives us the streaming is this pipe that sits in the middle so we can get data in and out and keep it there. Some people will keep it there for a long time. Some people will keep it there forever. So you could do replay, so you can move it other places. Having a lot of data is pretty easy now. You know, hosting terabytes or petabytes of data in this, you know, this infinite, if you got enough money, buffer. I have uh, a cloud client in China that has 10 petabytes of data that sits in one of these two guys in, you know, in the buffer in the stream, and then they tap it with Flink SQL, Java and Scala apps, you know, as needed. Because by the time they get to a database on storage and then move it somewhere else, takes too long. 
maybe for some big analytics, but if you're at 10 petabytes already, how big are those bigger analytics? That's, uh, I don't want to have to spend that cloud bill, but someone does. So we get data in, which if we have to handwrite everything, that's really tough, and that's a lot of work, and a lot of it is really boring work, or what's all the names of all the fields, what are all their data types, a lot of that is, you know, boilerplate code you got to constantly write. Try to avoid that, and I'll show you as part of this one tool I recommend to give you, do that for you so you don't have to do that part. So you could do the fun part that's further down where you're doing some business logic. Maybe you're incorporating machine learning, deep learning, doing stuff that has business value, has value for your, you know, use cases and not... Oh, I grabbed the, something out of a table and it worked, you know. <laughs> you, well, hopefully you don't have to do that kind of stuff. But they keep adding these new things to get data into and out of. And sometimes you're still writing that manual code. Not my favorite. So what are you, a Java developer or a data engineer? Well, these days you probably got to be both. If you saw all those different data sources. You know, it's, uh, fortunately, it's not that hard to be, you know, I call a streaming engineer, you know. Sometimes they'll make you do it in Python, but most things you could do in Java. You know, there's full libraries for all the streaming stuff for Java, which is really nice. And most of them are all or partially written in Java. So you've got a leg up. Java is not going anywhere for streaming because of its ability and scale and, JDK 20 is going to prove that out. Most of the streaming platforms are in either 11 or 17 already, and they're getting some big uh, improvements because of that. And as you'll see, there's some cats in my presentation, and there's some cats in those stickers. It's unrelated, but internet likes cats, so that means there's a lot of cats in data. We'll go from that. Apache Pulsar, you saw it on the door. If you haven't used it before, it is pretty awesome because it does something a little different from the rest of the streaming stack. It is really similar to Kafka, and you can use them interchangeably, and I personally have gone back and forth between both of them. Obviously, Kafka's got more you know, funding, been around longer, but there's a few features of Pulsar that are pretty compelling. Uh, one of them... Guaranteed message delivery with a lot of different semantic support. Scalability, when I say infinite, if you got enough money. Petabytes, not a problem. Once you get past petabytes, maybe that's going to be difficult. When you get past eight or 10,000 servers, not too many people know how to do that. Unified, this is not the buzz speak. This is all patchy open source. Why is it unified? Because that can support different protocols. And in the real world, you're doing Java apps against Kafka, AMQP, you know, you're doing Rabbit, MQTT, Rocket MQ, lots of different protocol support, including uh, REST, WebSockets. So very easy to get your data in and out, which is a boon for the Java people. Obviously, Spring has libraries for all those. So does Java has a ton of libraries for all those. But this is your way to talk to other languages that you don't really want to have to interface with directly. You know, Rust. People say, oh, I'm going to do part of the app in Rust. And they're like, oh, no, do I have to learn Rust to do that? Or Go or Python or Kotlin or something else? Java? No. They could use one of these libraries and get something into a message, and then you can be on the other side and receive it. And what's nice here is it's not a one-to-one. -one. You know, if you want to have your Java app talk to a thousand different types of apps, Rust, Java, uh, Spark, Flink, all these other things, they can all subscribe to it and get the data the way they want to get it. Now, they can get it exclusively. No one else can touch it. They get a dedicated subscription to it. Or you could decide maybe we get a key and we'll share that. This is a great one for CDC. Something changes in a database, maybe a table. I'll assign a key to that, and then whoever's going to consume it just does that key's worth. So if I do 
I had a company that took their entire SAP data store and dumped it into CDC all at once, you know, 25,000 tables, and they could spin up a number of consumers for each one, and they get it dedicated, which means I'll get it in order and get it exactly once. So if I have a table over here and I want to move it over here, I could do that in order, but I could do that in parallel because I could just key it out. It's a nice way to do that because you'll probably want to get it in, in order and exactly once. But sometimes you want to do a work queue, right? I've got a ton of things coming in. I want them processed. Maybe order doesn't matter. Support for shared. This is something more common with JMS style uh, message queues. You could do that with Pulsar. So that's nice. One platform to do all that type of messaging. Another feature that's unique to Pulsar versus Kafka is support for multi-tenants, which means I set up a tenant, and then underneath there, I set up some namespaces, and then I set up all my topics. So there's some companies use this to host multiple companies on one cluster or multiple groups. You could divide it as much as you want. Also means you could have better names for topics, so you're not trying to think of these giant, unique names or putting in codes to make them longer, because I could segment them by tenants and namespaces, and I know a couple of installments where they have more than a million topics. Not a problem with the number. That's a little tougher in Kafka, but it's workable. Very easy API. If you're using the base API and not using Spring, which is even easier, uh, you want to consume something, point to a topic, give it a subscription name. The subscription name is important because that means that's my mapping to the data. So everyone can have their own unique subscription or share one, which is cool that if you want multiple people processing data at the same time, share a subscription. If you want to have your unique copy of the data, you set that. The data will stay and not be removed until you're done with it. And what's nice is then I can acknowledge the data as I read it. When I'm done, it can go away. Obviously, if your system gets overloaded, then there's decisions that you could set up in the system to decide what happens if I have no more space for messages? Do I start expiring them? Do I not let new ones come in? You make those decisions. Pretty cool way to do that. And if you want to do one for failover, you just change the subscription type. And failover means I'm going to have exclusive rights to it unless I stop working, then let someone else take over for me. Nice way to split the difference. And again, being able to share the workload with other languages uh, across different protocols, uh, built-in different uh, connectors, same as in Kafka. This is nice, again, don't write code unless it provides value. You know, let someone else have the automated code to get that data into Pulsar, and then you could write your business logic around it. So you're not writing things to pull in generic data and go, okay, what was the name of that field? What's the name of that field? Keep going through them manually and have them come out the other side. What's nice is once you do that, then you could add some functions. These are kind of like database triggers. So when an event comes into a topic, you can have it execute, say, some Java for you. And that can be hosted in Kubernetes or in a regular environment. And we support two other languages there as well. That's a nice way to uh, add simple functionality to data, like maybe you want to validate it. Maybe this is how you interface to uh, chat GBT if you have textual data come in maybe send part of that off, add the results to your objects, and then push it into a new topic. If you want to do some further streaming, this is the part of streaming where you're doing the processing. There's a bunch of different engines out there. There's some more out there, but these are the primary ones that are easily supported. So Flink can read this stuff from Pulsar, Spark, Presto, Trino, fork of the same project. Uh, Lambda, some other ones can automatically be fed by this data or consume it on their own uh, requirements. Another nice feature of Pulsar in the open source, yes? Is this falling off? Oh, we lost like, what, an hour of that? Oh, that's a lot louder now. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, no one seemed to not hear me. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty echoey room here. And the last part, which is a cool feature, is we talked about what happens if you start running out of space. Now, you could tell people, stop it. Don't give me any more data or pause things or throw data away. Or you could have it automatically tear it out to much cheaper storage and do that, you know, either on size, timing, a bunch of different parameters. That's a cool feature. What's awesome about that is it's not gone into some place where you've got to manually pull it out of there. This is a area where you can easily just go and read it from there. And it looks transparent to you. So if I want to consume data from Pulsar, it comes out of there. You don't know where it's stored. If it's in the local Pulsar storage or in that tiered storage, that gives you extra functionality without work, which I really like that part. So I mentioned that support for those other protocols. When people hear multi-protocol uh, support, they think well, maybe it's a sidecar or it's a translation layer, an add-on, some kind of kludgy kind of hack to just make it work. It's, it's not. It is a full, deep support of those protocols, uh, a full implementation of them that's given the same level of uh, integration as the normal protocol. So Pulsar is designed to have multiple protocols plugged in, so it's not going to hurt you if you have, uh, if you want to use Kafka protocol with Pulsar, or if you want to use the Pulsar one, or if you want to uh, mix and match. So I could send a message in via Pulsar and pull it out via Kafka, or pull it out via Kafka and Pulsar at the same time. These are really cool features, and they're not, like I said, hacks. They get stored normally in Pulsar as if it came in any other way. Same with MQTT. Same with uh, AMQP or Rocket, uh, Rabbit. Rocket's another protocol we support. Uh, another cool feature, a little different from Kafka. Kafka has a separate schema registry and a couple different ones there. Uh, the schema registry for Pulsar is built in, so you don't have to think about it. In Java, you set up a bean, put the fields you want. The first time I push it in, that becomes my schema. If I change it next time I come in, I'm versioning it. So that makes it a really nice way to have schemas there to enforce what the fields are, what their types are, what they look like. And having schemas mean stuff looks like a table. If stuff looks like a table, I could do SQL against it, which means I could do SQL with stuff like Trino, like Flink SQL, like Spark SQL, like Rising Wave. There's a number of tools out there in the cloud that'll support anything that looks like a table. So it's nice to look like a table. If you know what your data is, you know, use that. Again, get into the next section. As you saw, it'd be nice to have one platform that did everything everywhere always. Uh, but you usually need a team to do it. And there's a team of different open source tools that really work well together to figure out different parts of an app that you're building. First up, call out to my spring friends and they're doing a session later today, I think in the same room. So uh, yeah, don't go anywhere. They're in the back, they're awesome guys. This works really well. I'll show you the thing, you can go to the start in spring and you have it up there already. So you can pick uh, reactive or the uh, vanilla one. Really easy to now do that. Uh, well documented and the code is really simple. I mean, like I mentioned before, getting the schema is the same in spring, set a class up, now I've got my schema, I know what fields I should have, I know what types they should have, if they're nullable, those sort of things, makes it really easy to have that contract on your data. Send my message, get an ID back, really easy. Consuming is, is almost trivial. I mean, you set the listener, put the subscription name and type, connect your topic, and this can all be in your in your, in your application uh, configuration document if you want, depending on the style you like. And then you get it, do with what you want with it. Again, you know, very easy to do these kind of stuff. Configuration, if you're doing it in uh, YAML, 
very easy. This is uh, if you're doing a secure one where you've got keys and OAuth and all those complexities, pretty easy to do that. I'm running on my laptop today because I don't trust the cloud at a conference because who knows if we'll have internet. It's been good so far, but it'll decide at 1025 not to work. Now we mentioned that multiple protocol support, so I can also use the uh, Spring libraries for Kafka, and they are also really straightforward. Now the great thing is, if I'm calling Kafka, you don't know, am I sending this to an Apache Kafka cluster, an Apache Pulsar cluster, Red Panda, Cloud Eras, some, someone else's, right? any of those? Anyone who supports the Kafka protocol, just send it there. Again, pretty similar library. I like the Pulsar one because it's uh, shiny and new and the team is in the back of the room, so I gotta say I like it a lot. It does work really well and hasn't crashed on me, which is pretty awesome. MQTT, same idea. A little more focused on IoT and not the most full-fledged uh, messaging, but it is fast and pretty simple. Support for that and rabbit protocol. Again, I could call a rabbit cluster or I could be calling Pulsar. You have no way of knowing unless you could determine what's going on at the uh, thing. I haven't updated my reactive, so there's probably an update. This should probably be cleaner, but this is just a really simple one I have to send one via uh, that style. But there's a lot of different uh, updates to the library. It, We'll see, he'll uh, show you some uh, things later. I keep adding more people to my uh, super friends. we got more people working together, but th these are the, the current super friends that I have for building apps. And I'll show you a couple different examples. Hopefully they won't blow up. Show you some different pieces of the puzzle. I give you some of my thoughts on when you should use, say, Spring, when you should use NiFi, when maybe Pulsar, when Flink couple different things and a little we've touched on those functions to do those triggers really simple this is a really simple example but when something comes in then I just send it out and you're like that's not I don't see anything about streaming in there which is really cool it's the configuration of this that says what topics are coming in what are coming out you do any of your business logic in there can call any Java library Boom, it does it. Pretty easy. I said we do Kafka, really similar to what we saw with Pulsar. Pub sub, but not support for multi tenancy, uh, not support for those different protocols without a proxy. But you know, you get the idea there. I have a open source environment in Docker, gives you access to Flink, Kafka, some other things. That's what I'm running my demos on and I have a Pulsar Docker running too. So there's a lot running on this laptop, so hopefully things don't blow up. Let's go through that quick. I'll show you a couple demos. I want to touch on NiFi. Sometimes you're not writing code, and it is glorious. After doing all that struggling with writing a ton of stuff and compiling it, sometimes I just want to drag and drop things between different areas to get my data going. Again, especially doing something like, uh, listen for an SFTP, grab that, convert it from XML to JSON, put it into Kafka, or put it into Pulsar, let someone read it after that for me. That's sort of basic, uh, get my data, do some filtering, routing, enrichment with it, send it to somebody else so they could do the rest of this. Uh, Java is supported in NiFi as well, it's written in Java. So if you said, Tim, I love it, but it's missing all these connectors, or all this functionality, or there's some feature I do every single app, well, you could write your own. The library is really simple. It is very sim similar to a simplified uh, version of uh, Spring. It comes in, you write data, write it out. Uh, very simple. Again, I said I'd touch on Spark. I got one slide on Spark. If you haven't seen Spark, it's a great way to do simple batch and micro batch processing of this data, and it'll connect to Kafka and Pulsar, let you do processing there. 
This tends to be more used with Python, SQL, and machine learning. Again, once I get data into Kafka or Pulsar, then I can hand it off to my data scientist to do some uh, stuff on it. Again, a nice part of that puzzle. Java app in the front, get it into Pulsar or Kafka, have some spark for my uh, data scientist. Uh, if I want to store my data, because eventually people want to store it forever in petabytes. Iceberg is really cool, open format, supported by a bunch of different companies, runs on cloud or on premise, scales up really huge, but allows you to do a lot of different uh, storage stuff like uh, acid compliance transactions, uh, rolling back data, looking at time travel, so saying, show me an hour ago what the data liked or what happened before we did this. Really cool, really fast format, again, supported by Pulsar, Kafka, Flink, and all those libraries. So you could just drop data in there and have it update at scale. And this is supported by a lot of different companies out there. And this is one of the formats used by uh, Snowflake. Flink is really cool. I'll show you that real quick. Again, if you, you can write Java apps against the Flink libraries. But for me, the easiest way to do it is just write SQL. Again, use Java for the hardcore stuff. Use uh, SQL to do things that are a pain or it would take a lot of stuff that are very well represented in SQL like joining data together, doing aggregates, windows, you know, pretty simple to use. I've got a tool here to uh, show you how to do it. Hopefully not everything in the world timed out. I wanted to show you that this is real. You could actually do the Pulsar right now. They got that up there. So you can build a new app right like that. And you can put Pulsar and Kafka in the same one. Just want to show you that was actually live. I am in NiFi. Uh, this is why I say this is a great way to start doing your data. This is not a representation of the app. This is the app. It is drag and drop, pick functionality, you know, sources, syncs, you know, different uh, processing, and do that with these uh, very easy to use connected boxes. And what's nice is each one of these boxes is a Java app that you can very easily deploy. So if I put my own in there, like I have some of my own custom ones in here, I could just drop one on there and it gets all the same features as all the other ones. I could set what properties I take. What's nice is in between each step is a queue and this is a configurable queue. So if I decide in the middle of processing something, let me go to a page here. You can run a lot of stuff in one. Here I'm stop this one because I could start and stop things on the fly while they're running either through the UI through rest or through a command line interface and just decide okay now I'm gonna just run it once maybe I'm testing okay data came through this is a configurable queue like if I stop the one before it too I could start uh, I could reconfigure this and I could do things like load balancing automatically between each step in this flow, because I can run this on a thousand node cluster, hundred node cluster, three node cluster, and pretty easily go, okay, round robin this, prioritize the data. This is how many objects I should be able to hold, and then just have it do that. And then when it's uh, not, just have it go through the system. Another nice feature I like for debugging the apps is support for this provenance. This is a step-by-step -step lineage of everything going on in an application. So I used the Spring app to get the data into Kafka or Pulsar. I got it into NiFi. Now I can see the full provenance of what this data is. I can actually see the data, uh, examine it, download it, and go, okay, everything looks good. I could also take that stream of metadata and push that into a database or into Kafka and then, or Pulsar, then use it as uh, real data, which is pretty cool. Here, I'm just gonna send a record to some Kafka cluster or Pulsar cluster or somebody else, who knows? Like if I look at the metadata, everyone supports the same ports. This actually is just running on my laptop in uh, Docker. There's a topic name. 
It's uh, Jason coming in, Avro coming out. Uh, I don't have to do any work to do that conversion. But if we look at the provenance, we could see the difference between what is output now versus what was output before. When I look at the output, we could see it's uh, Jason because uh, it looks, you can't really see the output because it goes into Kafka, which is, or it's in somewhere else. It could be in Pulsar, it could be in Kafka. It is in this topic here, go into the topic and it looks weird. That's because it's Avro. So I'll switch to Avro using that schema and then you could look and see it as JSON. You know, pretty easy to do. I have schemas set up here for the different libraries, you know, depending on what it looks like. Here I'm just running data to get it from REST. Now I have uh, an equivalent app here in Spring Pulsar to send it into a topic. This one, I've got some help. Maybe I should go into, I can't tell if it's big enough. That looks pretty big. Pretty easy. You see some people who have given me some help on this one. This was rewritten while we were going through the library. Uh, it's pretty easy. I'm just grabbing a bunch of REST data. And then once I have it ready, I'm uh, putting it into uh, to a Pulsar topic. This is the Pulsar version. Pretty easy. Let me just go into... Make it a little bigger there. Uh, pretty simple. I have this just on a delay just to constantly check it when the data is refreshed. I'll, I'll pull that REST data again. Again, sent the te template, regular class. Get the data back from that service that did the REST call. And just do a synchronous send via Pulsar into uh, the topic. Again, really easy to do. I put a key on there. Very important when you're doing streaming to have a key so you know where, where each record is. It's a good way to track things going on so we don't lose data because it's very easy to uh, forget what data you have. I wanted to show a feature they put in here which I think is really cool. I, don't, I haven't seen a too deep use for it for me, but other people may is to put an interceptor on here. So here, before, uh, when a send gets acknowledged in Pulsar, when I send it to the uh, broker, it'll tell me that message is acknowledged, I got it. And then when that happens, I could do something. Maybe I write a database. Maybe I delete the original data. Here I'm just uh, outputting the producer name and some uh, data that I have but you could do whatever is important for your application because you know it was, it successfully made it to Pulsar, so it's not lost. So your transaction's done. Got whatever data I wanted, made it to Pulsar, got my acknowledgement back. This automatically hits my, uh, my uh, acknowledgement here in this interceptor and I could do whatever I want, which could be logging, delete the source data, send a message somewhere, whatever kind of makes sense for your application. And let me run it. I'll build it. Just show you that. Um, I haven't done the work to move this over to uh, a native executable, which uh, Josh has been asking me to do, but uh, he didn't ask me today, so it's not done. Uh, so this is just an example of it running. And the output here is you can see that interceptor. I'm outputting the whole schema. Uh, the data came back. All those different fields we showed. What was the, the message ID so I can look that up? What was the key that I used on the message just so I could see it? So I'm sending it, and as, as soon as I'm sending it, the interceptor is calling, showing that, that it's happening. Now I wrote uh, another one to do this without Pulsar, and this is via Kafka. Again, the difference is, is pretty minimal. Again, is it going to a Kafka cluster? Is it going to a Pulsar cluster? You know, I could change that on the fly. Again, get the data in, send it to Kafka. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward to do that. It's not, uh, 
This is a very easy API to work with. Not to, really can't complain about it. And we can run that one as well, just to show you the difference. And we'll make sure it's built. And we'll run it, same idea here, but it's connecting to, uh, we'll say a Kafka cluster. And I could just check that, see if I'm getting those messages. Uh, one of them is going to air quality. That was the, uh, that's the one we were running right now. We can make sure, uh, let's see, make sure we got some new data. Okay, 1036, that's the new data that just made it into uh, that topic. So we could see very easy to run those. Now doing the same type of app with Spring where I'm doing uh, in NiFi, REST endpoint, uh, do some uh, enrichment of the data, split it out. Also, I took out uh, some fields I didn't like in there. There's some extra fields I don't need. I could do some stuff manually in some code. Here, I'm just gonna use a JSON path to pull out the fields I'm interested in, build a new record, add a couple of fields I need. This one, I'm just adding timestamp. Filter out anything that's uh, not interesting. I'm doing air quality. There's a bunch of different air quality readings. I just wanna look at the PM10 readings. And if they're over a certain value, I wanna do something. So I had that simple SQL. And then from there, put it, push it into a cluster. I could see if anything uh, happened here. It's at, it's at one message. There's all the metadata. Uh, where did it send it to? I could look in my metadata because I don't remember which topic it was. Uh, we could take a look here. Uh, open AQ, so I should look at uh, Open AQ here. So I'll do, uh, I got two different AQs because uh, one I'm sending as JSON, one I'm sending as uh, Avro because uh, I have a reader that likes Avro better. So, you know, it's pretty easy to do both. And then why I do both is so I could do a Flink SQL here. So as uh, data comes in, oh, I guess data's coming in. So as it comes in, it's coming into my Flink SQL. That's my SQL statement. Grab a couple fields and display them. What you see is as a new event comes in, it gets it and displays it. Now the other end of this, I can turn this into a REST feed that gets this as those data comes in. Or instead of a select, this can be an insert into, and that can be anything that Flink SQL has a sync for which could be a Kafka topic, a Pulsar topic, iceberg table, some kind of database, data store. So I can have these events come in and get inserted automatically as they happen with simple SQL. Or I could wrap this in a Java app and deploy that as a Flink app. You know, the difference under the covers isn't much. It deploys it as an app and it gets deployed to whatever's in my uh, Flink cluster. I don't really have to think about it, which is nice. I think I have a couple of minutes, so we'll see that one. I'll leave that one running until my laptop runs out of space running a Spring app, a Flink app, a NiFi app, a Pulsar cluster, a Kafka cluster, a schema registry, Chrome. Chrome probably takes more memory than all those servers together. You know, when you come down to it. Uh, guess we have good time for questions, if anyone has any questions. Uh, this is, sitting through this now, you are a streaming engineer, you're enlightened. And now you can put that on your resume. You've learned enough to build streaming apps. And all the source code is out there. All the projects are out there. I put out new resources every week. You know, you want to learn more. There's more uh, apps out there. Coming up, do not miss this one if you want to do more in-depth on the spring with Pulsar. I think that's 11.30, which is very soon. Get a snack. Come right back in here. Don't lose your seat. There'll be more people in that one. That should be a good talk. Uh, I'm doing a meetup in San Francisco uh, in a couple of weeks. That should be a good one. Uh, we've got the uh, talk coming out, webinar on NiFi with the, the people at the NSA. Oh, I didn't mention, NiFi was created by the NSA. 
in case you're like that or don't like that or curious about it, you want to know what technology can read from live missiles? Oh, nice, I could do that. And I know that from experience. Uh, April 26th, I'm doing a talk at the Real-Time Analytics Summit with some IoT use cases with Pulsar and Pino, and Kafka and Pino. NiFi is probably in there as well. Uh, same thing at the Open Source Summit. I'm going to be virtual there because I couldn't get approval to go to Vancouver, which stinks. Uh, scan this to get more uh, stuff about data and cats. And thank you. If there's any questions, if there's spring questions, the guys are in the back. Are we till 11:30? If there's anything on Pulsar, NiFi, Kafka, uh, yeah. other stuff, streaming. Yes. I saw a slide pop up. It said uh, open your Oh, I thought it. I thought it was too high level, but we can go back there. There's a lot of, I, I, I do too many slides. Uh, which one? This one? What would you like to know about it? Or you just wanted to see it. You're like, what's going on there? Okay, this is, um, Cloudera is a company that puts out an open source uh, data platform that combines the technologies you saw Kafka, Flink, Spark, NiFi, Iceberg, whole bunch of stuff with some automated management. So all those projects on Kubernetes managed for you in the public cloud with some additional things. SDX provides uh, lineage, governance, security, encryption, uh, things like Apache Knox, Apache Ranger, Apache Atlas, all automated for you together. So things are spun up, things are done in a secure manner, you know, everything's done with end levels of security, but APIs are open so you can use standard Flink. And I showed you the, uh, the IDE that sits on top of this for Flink that's in that uh, CSP release I showed you. You download that, that's a mini version of that in Docker. So you could run the streaming part of that. Uh, there's a dashboarding thing you could spin up as part of this in the cloud. Uh, again, support for data lakes, again, on top of Iceberg with a bunch of different SQL engines of your choice to spin up on the fly. Kind of nice. Support for Kafka Streams apps, Link apps, Spark apps. Um, the ability to do data engineering on the fly. We spin up a managed airflow cluster for you. You run your data engineering jobs. Uh, we spin up a machine learning environment for you. We could do Jupyter notebooks or Zeppelin notebooks or support for other uh, third party systems there. Kind of everything you want spun up in an environment. I try not to talk too much about corporate stuff, but this environment is part of that. This is uh, an environment to do run Flink SQL jobs. I have a number of jobs configured here. They're currently stopped because this is running on my laptop one. Uh, this one shows you some of the SQL you could do. Uh, doing all that on data as it comes and aggregated over the events as they arrive, do max and min on that. I do this when I do a live plane demo, monitoring the planes coming by. Pretty easy to do that sort of stuff, unions, uh, this is Apache Calcite, the same engine used in uh, Phoenix, used in NiFi. A ton of people use that SQL engine. It's pretty close to SQL 92, very rich uh, SQL format there, with a little extra for different streaming things that make sense for that. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So, um, I'm quite familiar with Apache Kafka, and I'm still a little bit struggling to see why I would use both Kafka and Pulsar. You could just use Pulsar. Now, obviously Kafka has the support of some of the largest companies in the world, which is very nice. Uh, these sort of things for certain, you find your need for Pulsar when you get to certain use cases. And those certain use cases are, I now have 50 Kafka clusters. 
Managing 50 Kafka clusters is more work than you need. I could have one Pulsar cluster that does all that. You usually spit up Kafka clusters because you have more than 100,000 topics, you've got different companies, so you, you can't segment clusters with Kafka, Apache Kafka. Confluent has some of the features of this in their commercial offering. This is in the open source offering where you have support for the tiered storage, the multi-tenancy, so I could set up tenants, of course, built-in replications, so you could have multiple active-active clusters, but support for millions of topics, support for those other protocols. Uh, if, you, if you're an enterprise that's been around for more than a week, you also have J, 10 JMS clusters and a Rabbit cluster and all these other messaging styles you're doing. One Pulsar cluster can do the, all the Kafka stuff, all the Rabbit stuff, all your IoT MQTT stuff. If you're using Cassandra, it's very well integrated with that. Uh, it depends what your environment is. We tend to see this in advertising. A lot of ad people do both types of messaging. Pulsar is also very fast. I won't get into benchmarks because whoever runs them, they happen to win. But you know, you could tweak tweak your benchmark to work good for your stuff. But it doesn't run any slower than Kafka, that's for sure. And the other feature I really like is Kafka. They're moving towards one node for everything right? Which is pro and con. If I want to add more nodes to my cluster, I better add the biggest node I've ever seen in my life with a really big SSD. Pulsar splits out the broker that just does communication, uh, you know, moving messages around. And a storage engine is completely separate, and it's not sitting on a flat file system. The uh, storage layer is Apache Bookkeeper, which is a full-fledged ledger system, so it stripes it out, make sure you don't lose your data, and has that built-in tiering. And then we use a metadata store to handle the metadata. Whether that gets pushed into the broker or somewhere else like Kafka did is a debate, but we support multiple types of metadata stores. Obviously the old school Zookeeper, which is probably going away at some point, but also support for SED. And we've been talking with a number of other open source vendors to make sure those are supported. So if you're running Kubernetes, you have etcd anyway. Just use that for your metadata. Not really any extra cost. Full all the uh, Kafka, all the uh, Kubernetes brokers, and all those kind of things are public uh, open source. So you could run a full Kubernetes cluster just using the open source, which is nice. Okay. So, and just make sure I'm, I'm tracking correctly, um, Pulsar wants to sort of be that hub that all the other, you know, your other streaming uh, libraries and tools are going to be feeding into or plugged into. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Kind of where Kafka would otherwise be. Yeah. Um, and you would have Kafka feeding into Pulsar, but you could probably do it the other way around. You could do both. We do have people who have them, because there's Pulsar has syncs and sources to Kafka, and they could actually replicate. We've had... If you saw um, Ricardo's talk the other day on Kafka, yeah. he's done a talk on doing uh, replication between Kafka and Pulsar using uh, MM2. So you could use Mirror Maker 2 to push to Pulsar. Do you want to do that? Do you want it? I don't know. It works. I mean, it supports all the libraries. It might make sense more of have... Uh, Pulsar just act as sit, maybe even sit in your stretch cluster. I don't know. Or just have certain topics get pushed into that. It's up to you. I mean, telling people drop all your existing stuff and move to a new thing, that never works. That's why this is nice. It could sit in there, first use case, Pulsar only, then you go, well, why don't we also push my existing rabbit stuff there, push it to both places, and then when we're happy with it, turn the old one off and be able to take that old data that goes into Rabbit and then maybe just goes to Oracle, have that also go into Pulsar, and Pulsar can feed it to your Kafka cluster on specific topics if you want. Again, a nice way to, you know, bridge between cloud, bridge between legacy apps. It's kind of nice that way. In the back? Um, yeah, so uh, I got a question. You kind of brought it up earlier. 
So can we talk about the motivation to use a bookie um, versus um, journaling, like most other high performance listening tools? Why did they pick that? Well, why use an external? I mean, I get the I get the whole separation of storage, you know. But it seems like to me that getting that storage is going to you know give you uh, more latency than if you had a, an internal journaler like say AMQ or some of the other high performance messages. I'm not sure what motivated Yahoo to do that. I could say on all the performance numbers. It, it works. I mean, there is some layers of caching and maybe something like AMQ when you're doing a single node. Uh, a single node that's high, designed just to do a single node. This was designed from the beginning to be distributed. So you may give up some slight level of performance, but we haven't seen it at the you know, 10 cent scale, an Alibaba scale. So maybe it's existing. If you have something that's a fraction of a millisecond's a big deal, and you only have one node and you're not scaling out. If you're scaling out though, you need something that can scale out easier and keep multiple copies. Those are kind of motivating factors for someone like Yahoo. Like, I need to scale out to massive loads. I need to share this with Kafka consumers and share this with other people. It's not going into a dedicated app. That's kind of thing, yeah. You could take something like, uh, there's some great Java libraries if you're running on one app that do ridiculous throughput for messaging, but they're running, you know. If I, if I can reach everyone using my app, use something, maybe do it all in memory. Got enough memory now. I mean, my phone has 32 gig of RAM. How much you put on, I have a few people use have it, four terabytes of RAM on there. If I have something that'll fit in four terabytes, I'd rather run that in RAM on that machine with a custom library like uh, Chronicle. Why not? But that's not most people's use case. Most people are, I need to not lose the data. A lot of people are consuming it. You know, if it's a fraction of a second slower or slight latency, we do have all those extra caching layers. Your app is probably slow enough that you're not even getting that because you got to go over the network. Our latency is always lower than the network. The network's the slowdown. But that's cool. Anything else? I don't know how much time I've got. I don't want to get into, uh, I don't know if the, no, the 11's a break, so. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody want to see anything? See if we can break something. Otherwise, I'll let you get to your, uh, Looking at the vendors, there's some cool swag out there still. There's some cool snacks. Definitely come to the next Pulsar session after the break. And 130 upstairs in the big room. And there'll be Kafka and Pulsar. I don't know how much of the debate they'll do there. Probably some. It's definitely, I'm curious on how that's going to be. That should be very cool. Uh, otherwise, thank you. And there's some stickers up front over there. And some coasters. So don't make uh, a stain with your beverages. Thank you.